everyone, and welcome back to the Towards Data Science podcast. Now, for today's episode, we'll be talking to Angela Fan, a researcher at Meta AI, whose latest work is focused on Wikipedia article generation. Now, that's an important problem. Wikipedia has essentially become the internet's encyclopedia of record, and hundreds of millions of people use it to understand the world. But over the last decade, it's also become a critical source of training data for data-hungry text generation models, which means that any shortcomings in Wikipedia's content are at risk of being amplified by the text generation tools of the future. Now, in part, correcting for those shortcomings means writing articles that cover blind spots in the Wikipedia corpus, like topics and people who should have articles but don't. Now through that lens, the project of Wikipedia article generation is about much more than it seems. It's quite literally about setting the scene for the language generation systems of the future and empowering humans to guide those systems in more robust ways. Now Angela joined me to talk about her latest project, the implications of long form, high quality text generation, and the future of human AI collaboration on this episode of the Towards Data Science Podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. There's so many ways in which your career, your work is so fascinating that we're gonna, we're gonna have, I'm sure, uh, the chance to explore all those different facets. I'd love to start though with, um, with your journey into meta AI and like kind of what brought you here and, and what brought you to the world of like language modeling and, and all kinds of cool stuff that you're working on today. Well, um... I don't think I really had a strong conceptualization of what I wanted to do. So I knew that I was interested in studying more math and statistics in university, but I was also interested in being pre-med um, until oh, I actually too. went to volunteer. Yes, so I was pre-med for the longest time and then I actually went to volunteer at a hospital um, and it was extremely sad because many people at the hospital are chronically ill. And so I just felt like I wasn't you know, like strong enough as a person to really be in that environment. And so I was like, okay, not for me. And I was like, okay, well, what can I do with my statistics degree? And most people I think go into finance or consulting, right. but most students who study finance or consulting, let's just say they were more put together than me. So they had like a lot of their internships and like everything. And so I was kind of like there my final year of university. I didn't really have too many internships. And so I was like, let me apply for this new career like data science it was like a very like a hot new thing and so I was like okay so I sent out a million applications what year and, was this by the way if you don't mind me asking I uh, graduated in 2016 okay okay so really yeah really nascent okay <laughs> so I sent out like a million data science applications um due to my lack of like many internships I was not like a very competitive candidate so only Facebook reached out back to me and so I was like okay only like I really Facebook. pray that I get this job <laughs> Um, yeah, so I joined Facebook as a data scientist. Well, now Meta, then Facebook. Um, afterwards, I, I enjoyed it, but I wanted to do more long-term AI research. I felt that research was something I enjoyed doing a little bit in my undergrad. And so at the time, FAIR was hiring engineers. Well, let's just say my coding was not so good, right? <laughs> uh, so I did a little interview to transition into engineering learned a lot of coding on the job, like truly mm. quite a bit. And then afterwards I thought like, okay, cool. Like I'm an engineer, but I didn't know if I wanted to keep doing engineering long-term. And so then I decided to do my PhD just to like have a little bit more time to learn and explore different ideas. And yeah, I guess now I've graduated very recently, just graduated in November. And what was the focus of your PhD? It was on uh, NLP. So I focused mainly on text generation. I'm very interested essentially in creative things. I always wanted to be an artist as a child. And so I read a lot. And so I was always very interested in like how, um, how to help other people write. And so I think many of us like think about writing aids as it can be like really common, right? Like when you're texting someone, um, yeah. Apple will like suggest you like the next word to text or like even an email, uh, you know, Google will help you like, you know, compose the best Gmail thing or tools like Grammarly. But I was really interested in like more creative generation. So I started um, a lot of my AI research in the field of story generation. So mm. how to help people think about plots or think about interesting characters or interesting settings and being able to develop the plot over time. And then I started 
being interested in things like summarization, like very practical tooling. And so I continued that in my PhD. Okay, really interesting. So th those are both, I guess, things that involve very like long, I guess in the language of transformers, like long attention windows, right? Like you're talking about crafting a story that unfolds across many chapters or summarizing very large bodies of text, which is interesting because it does relate, it seems pretty closely to the work you've done recently that we'll be getting into today, I'm sure, on this, this kind of Wikipedia article generation because these articles are so long and they have so many different parts that have to kind of connect to each other. Is, is that, so was it a natural transition over to the, the Wikipedia problem? And actually, I'd, I'd love to hear also what brought you there, like what, what motivated you you take that on uh, in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So I've always been interested in long text. And when I first started in AI, like LSTMs were, you know, still the, right. the tool. And we shifted to more convolutional architectures. And then the rise of transformers, I think. And it's definitely been something where, you know, when I first started in AI, like writing individual sentences was like still the focus, right? Having a beautifully fluent sentence. And back when I started, like when you did human evaluation, it was on things like grammatical correctness or like mm -hmm. capitalization. And now like, we're like, okay, we can write sentences. We can even write like sentences linked together. And now it's more about like how fluent overall longer pieces of text look. And that's definitely been something that like kind of drove a lot of my AI interests. Um, speaking about Wikipedia, well, so I, I use a lot of Wikipedia. Um, and actually when I started dating my husband, something I noticed is that he always reads the Wikipedia page of the day. And so I started reading like a lot more Wikipedia just for fun. I think before I used Wikipedia mainly as like, okay, when I have a question, I Google it and like the top link is usually Wikipedia. So like yeah. I click on it. Um, but then I started exploring a lot of Wikipedia just on my own, like reading and, and spending a lot of time learning different things. And I started, you know, the more you click around on Wikipedia, I think the more you feel that there are things missing. <laughs> so for me, a lot of it was on the biographies about women. And so when I was an undergrad, I had um, a thesis advisor who was female. And I noticed that like many of the other people in the department had like nice Wikipedia pages, but my thesis advisor did not have a Wikipedia page. And so I started thinking a lot about like role models and influence in my own career. And so that's how I discovered this project called the Wikipedia Women in Red Project. And it's called Women in Red because on Wikipedia, if you have someone's name and they don't have an article, it's a link in red, not a link in blue. And so the goal of Wikipedia Women in Red is to turn red links into blue links. And so I followed that for like a long time. I wrote a few articles myself, not like a huge contributor, but followed that for a long time. And so for the end of my PhD, I was like, well, I've worked a lot in text generation. Wikipedia is like one of the main focuses of NLP in general as a data right. source, but also like writing Wikipedia. And so I was thinking, okay, I really want the last project of my PhD to be something super meaningful, something that I wanted to do for a while. And so I wanted to merge my like long interest in inclusion on the web, basically with kind of some of my own personal interests um, and my research focus. And so that's how I landed on this like Wikipedia biography writing project. That's really cool and so so interesting how seamlessly it fit into your your broader story. I mean, it's it's so rare to have that confluence that and also the tools to to make something happen in that direction. I, I do wonder, like in this context, one of the questions I imagine you had to take on is like figuring out like what threshold of let's say interest or or importance uh, a person might have to meet in order to warrant a Wikipedia article. Because I guess at a certain point, like I guess we can't all have Wikipedia articles. Yeah, super interesting. So when I started following Women in Red, I learned a lot more about, you know, how people think about this. And so on Wikipedia, there's actually like guidelines around what, what, what they call notability. And the mm -hmm. idea of notability is that in order to have a biography, you know, you can't just be like any random person on the street, like you need to be notable enough. And so they have a lot of guidelines on what that means. So for many academic professors, like usually achieving tenure, for example, is like, you know, okay. good enough. Um, and, but for an average person, usually notability is about having enough secondary sources who can validate like that you are a person of general interest and you don't wanna just be tied to one event, um, in which case you should be like described in the Wikipedia article for that event. But then I started like taking a step back and this is something I saw a lot in, in this AI paper specifically, where like the requirement to have secondary sources in order to be notable 
means that the bias of society is also heavily influential on this. So for example, many famous female scientists, they might only have primary sources about them, uh, like sources from their employer, but there, there might not be like a, a sufficient number of secondary sources. So like news articles about that person's work. And so in the Women in Red project, like one of the things that is very difficult is just like, even if someone should meet the notability criteria, like having enough references on the web to be able to create this article to cite them. And also on Wikipedia, if you want to create like a high quality article, you often want like a picture of the person, a lot of information right. for the info box. And so like, does this person have a nice like um, open license picture of themselves? And so even though the notability criteria for a biography on Wikipedia is like quote unquote pretty clear, it's actually quite hard to actualize. And it means that a lot of the work is about like, there's just not enough information about people on the web from all of these different sources. And so that's something that I, I felt like was um, unfortunate. So there's an art, I guess, to, well, doing what you can with, with what you have, like the limited amount mm -hmm. of secondary, secondary sources. And I guess a big part of this too is also incorporating, because when I looked at, at the, um, the, the write-up that you put together, it seems like there's also this, you're not just writing the articles, you're also adding the references and kind of linking this all together, which just seems like a very complex, meaty task. I'd love to, to hear what you unpack, like what is going on in this system? Like how, do, how are you generating these articles from a almost mechanical process? A mechanical yeah, perspective. I uh, sure, sure. I'm super excited to describe. Definitely, I want to start by saying that I view this as like a starting point. This technology is definitely not like ready to deploy. As someone who reads like a ton of Wikipedia, like the quality of Wikipedia and that the fact that that stays really high is like extremely important to me. And I want to make it clear to everybody that we are not ready to like freeform deploy AI right, yeah. on Wikipedia. Um, yeah, so I think as a thinking about writing an article as a human, so usually, you know, the first thing you decide is like, okay, who am I writing an article about? And so that that's the first thing that you need to supply to our AI model as input. So the AI does not decide who gets an article, like the human writer would decide that. And because people's names are very common, sometimes right. it's hard to disambiguate them. And so you are also asked to provide some information about their occupation, uh, just to kind of get the model started a little bit, because like, especially for many people, there might be many people who have your name. And so you wanna help the model narrow down. And then as a human writer, the first thing you usually do is go and like read about that person, you learn about them. So when I was in school, like in elementary school that involved going to the library, nowadays we use the web. And so we use a search engine to search the web and the model takes the person's name and their occupation and tries to search the web for information. One of the big things that we try to do in our work is try and leverage the Wikipedia article structure. And so when you're a human, like writing an essay, uh, let's say my brother, you know, he's all about the five paragraph essays because he's in grade school. And so like, you know, when he writes his five paragraph essay, he knows uh, roughly what he's going to try and write in each paragraph. And he knows, okay, I have to make three supporting points in my thesis statement and then wrap it up in the conclusion. And so if you think about a lot of AI models today, they don't really have that conception. So they just start from the beginning of the word and they write to the end of the word. So when we're thinking about Wikipedia biographies, we try and think about them as structured documents. And biographies have a very natural structure. They usually start with early life, then it gets into the person's career, a list of achievements. If it's an actress, often like they list their entire filmography. And so the structure is somewhat predictable. Mm -hmm. And so the way the model works is it goes section by section and it tries to find more relevant information based on that section. So if you know that we're writing the person's career section, it'll Google like, okay, person's name, occupation, career, and try and find relevant information. So then it reads that information uh, through a retrieval type mechanism which has become very popular uh, recently, especially in the field of question answering. And then it tries to write that paragraph from the first word to the last word. And then of course on Wikipedia, you know, you can't just write anything, you have to cite your source. And this is extremely important, the verifiability on Wikipedia. And it's very difficult uh, now for AI models to have like pure explainability. I think that one of the common things in AI is just that the model has decided something, but like, how did it reach that conclusion? Yeah. And so, the way we implement this is that as the AI model reads the text and retrieves relevant information, we try and keep track of where it came from. And after the paragraph, we basically cite those sources. And I thought this was really useful because then as a human writer, if you wanted to improve upon this AI draft, you could go in and like check those sources 
as well and have like a, a starting point uh, for your own writing. Okay, very interesting, especially the, the references piece. And it seems like, there, I mean, there's a lot of talk in the machine learning community, especially language modeling, about reducing the assumptions that models make about the world, the inductive priors that they use, like, you know, moving from convolutional nets to transformers, you know, making fewer and fewer assumptions about the, the shape and structure of the data. And it seems like, it seems like this is an interesting counter trend where you say, okay, well, we have powerful language models. They're not quite powerful enough yet to generate an entire book or an entire article in one shot. But if we feed it just a little bit of like a little inductive prior about the structure of this, all of a sudden we see better performance. Is, is that an accurate framing or is there anything you think is missing there in that analysis? Yeah, I mean, I think in language model field, like the whole field of prompting, for example, is like a, a sense of like, okay, you know, the model can generate anything, but I'm going to feed a specifically designed prompt in order to right. increase the probability that I get the exact output that I want. And this whole idea of like properly doing the prompt engineering and stuff to kind of hot start the model um, has been like a, a large field. And I think that there's been a lot of papers recently on like how exactly should you create the prompt, you know, language models, they can do question answering. But that requires you to be like, question, here is my question, and then like answer, and then the model starts generating. And I think that all, a lot of this has just been studying the behavior of the model to try and kind of backfill like what is the proper prompt in order to get the performance that you want. And can you speak to the, the architecture that you went with? Yeah, so I would say the overall architecture, we kept it pretty simple. Um, it's a sequence to sequence transformer. So the input is a transformer encoder network that basically reads the input. Then you have an intention mechanism linking the encoder and the decoder transformer network. One of the things that we add is a retrieval mechanism. So the field of question answering has like advanced a lot on retrieval mechanisms. Here we keep it uh, fairly straightforward. So we have a separate model, an encoder only model that encodes the different sentences that the model is looking at. And then um, we attend over those and we do like a little top K attention to find the most relevant information. Uh, one of the things that we do add uh, for the decoder side is this mechanism called caching. And the idea is that in transformers, you know, there is long context, but there's not that much long context. And so when you're writing a Wikipedia article section by section, it can be important to know what the model has previously written. And because we write section by section, it, the model wouldn't normally have access to the previous section. And so we kind of cache the um, you know, the output of the previous section and let the model attend over that in the decoder. And so you can think about that as like, you know, if you have a very long context transformer, like the long former or the document or the doc former, there's many names now, uh, and you write from word one to word n, it would kind of naturally have that. But because we're going section by section, we kind of wanted to re-augment that, which would hopefully cut down on repetition. I'm curious about the, the quality as well, the text that's generated here, because you are tackling such a, a challenging problem. Wikipedia has, as you pointed out, it has like this this vibe to it as well, where there's just a certain way that Wikipedia articles are written. So you got to capture that as well as the references. They've got to, everything's got to connect together. So what, what, what are some of the, the metrics that you've used to assess the quality of the generated text? Yeah, so you're totally right that Wikipedia articles have to be written in like a very neutral sense, right? They're not meant for like advertisement or anything. And so we mainly focus on, um, well, so in our work, we curated a set of biographies about women. So because it stems from personal interest, uh, a lot of the data set is female scientists. Uh, I also focus on women in Asia and also women in Africa. Um, I focus a lot in my work in general on, on translation as well. And so I've been working a lot on African languages translation and, and part of Masakane, mm. the African languages um, research group, I guess. And so that's where a lot of these um, kind of interests create, uh, created this data set. And so our main metric is pretty common in text generation. It's just like, okay, the model generated this paragraph. How similar was that to the paragraph that a human editor on Wikipedia wrote? And it's roughly like a measure of word overlap. Um, we also measure like longest substring overlap. So you get more points for, you know, having longer sequences. But a lot of our work also relies on human evaluation mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to evaluate factuality in um, automated fashion. And so I kind of think of, uh, you know, there's the world that the model has generated. There's the world that the human editor uh, has written. And then there's the world of like other information on the web about this person. Because the human editor on Wikipedia, maybe they only wrote like a subset of information about that person on the web, right? So there could be other information. And so what we do is that we 
uh, basically break our written paragraphs into sentences and we ask um, other human annotators uh, to check each sentence and the entire sentence needs to be correct for us to mark it as accurate so it's extremely uh, stringent and so we ask okay like is the sentence correct um, with respect to the wikipedia article which means that you know the real wikipedia article could validate 100 percent of that information yeah. and if not like go check on the web right because maybe the wikipedia article a writer didn't use all of the information on the web and so we try and break down like where the factuality concerns happen. And it's, it's very interesting because it's it's quite hard for 100% of a sentence uh, to be accurate. I bet, uh, yeah. But how, that is the standard that we should be we should be shooting for when we talk right. about text generation technology. Yeah, this, this immediately, um, it makes me think of a, a tweet that I often think about from Amanda Askell at OpenAI. I think at one point she, uh, she was referring to, to questions around AI ethics regarding different algorithm types. And about a, a kind of trend that's emerged where people will tend to spot like one issue, one problem with an algorithm. And the moment that an issue is spotted, this is taken as a reason to simply not deploy it or not use it, rather than doing a kind of cost benefit analysis, which is a kind of more nuanced and difficult thing to do, but it seems like something we ought to do, especially in these contexts. It's certainly better than nothing to have some sort of system. Um, I, I'm curious about like, A, your thoughts on that, and B, I'd, I would love to hear some of the metrics around accuracy, like how, what fraction of sentences turned out to be fully correct and, and what fraction not? Yeah, so I think we found that around like 50% of the sentences could be validated some in some capacity, like either from the web or from the reference. You can check the exact paper. There's like a little bit of a different breakdown for the different parts of it. Um, and I, one of the interesting things was just like reflecting on why things were not accurate. And so sometimes they were just like minor facts, like for example, um, you know, the year that the person was born was not correct. Um, and that's something where, you know, you can try and develop some sort of automated way maybe to detect this. Other uh, factuality errors were a lot more interesting. It was like the, the writing style was not correct. So some words have like a very negative or very positive connotation. Um, and so words are not perfectly synonyms, for example. Right. And so things are being marked incorrect because the, um, the overall meaning, like the takeaway feeling that you get from that sentence doesn't match like what it should have been. It should have been like a lot more neutral. Um, so there's like a lot of different layers of accuracy. And then some things like uh, they imply the wrong conclusion. And so like part of the sentence will be accurate, but then like the way it was phrased does not lead the reader oh, to the right conclusion. And so like, I think accuracy and factuality, it's such a nuanced field. And we almost need to do like a, a breakdown of like all of the different possible yeah. errors that can occur. Just in regards to your first question, I think on like, at what point can models become useful? And I think this is like a very, very interesting question for me, um, especially as someone who works on text generation, because let's take translation for, for an example. Mm -hmm. I think translation is one of the like largely widely used pieces of text generation technology. I think almost everyone kind of rolls up on their vacation, like opens their Google Translate app. And like a lot of times people kind of take it for granted that it's accurate. Right. Um, and so there's clearly like value in having translation, even though we can't guarantee that every single sentence is accurate, accurately translated. But there's also a lot of harm because when the translation is not accurate, you know, you might not know, or some people might be using that translation to translate like legal documents or something extremely important for themselves. And so I think that there is like a line there and it almost speaks to like, how can we understand if a technology will be valuable and also like properly thinking through, you know, sometimes when we create technology, we have like a great um, optimism about how it will be used, right. but you never know like how someone might actually use it. And so I think thinking through the possible harms and the effect it can have on different people and different populations is extremely important. And so when you think about things like Wikipedia article generation, you know, if you can, if you just train a model on Wikipedia, you should understand that it doesn't represent uh, the different groups in the world, like very equally. And so that's something that hopefully our work can help people measure and just get an understanding of that effect. Yeah, and it's also so hard to predict the future. As you said, I mean, this is also a work in progress. So there's, I guess there's a, a mixing together of challenges that come from just like this technology not being fully mature and then challenges that come from, okay, what, what happens when we live in a world where anyone can generate a Wikipedia article really quickly? Like what malicious uses could that entail as well? It's, it's such a multi-headed hydra. Um, but to, to focus in on the capabilities piece, I, I suspect this is something you'll have thought of already, but I wonder um, what are, 
like what's the psychological impact here on a person using this automated tool? If let's say I'm trying to write a Wikipedia article really, really quickly, and it, let's say it's about Rosalind Franklin or something, and I'm hacking away, uh, I get an autocomplete for a sentence with a fact that's claimed, and I'm tired or whatever, and I'm just kind of like, I don't feel like double checking this. And then because it's immersed in the context of facts that seem so accurate generally on average, like, is there a bigger risk that, that uh, hallucinated fa facts, as I think you referred to them in, uh, in the write-up, um, will s kind of sneak in? Is that, is that a bigger risk with this technology, or do you see ways around that that are technical as well? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand this. So one of the analogies I have is like the Wikipedia content translation tool. So if you want to write an article in another language on Wikipedia, Wikipedia hopefully helps you do that. So it takes the original article you want to want to write about, let's say in English, and for me, let, let's say it translates it into Chinese, okay? <laughs> um, Actually, Wikipedia, uh, you know, it doesn't allow you just to press publish on that, right? Because that would risk like having machine translated content of poor quality hit Wikipedia. And so there's like a minor, there's like a threshold of how much Wikipedia thinks you have to edit, which I think is like 50% of the article must be have must have been edited by the human editor. And so I think that if we do have AI tooling, you know, the community needs to establish some standards, uh, especially first the Wikipedia editing community, but I also think society in general, I'm like, what is like an acceptable amount of standard for these things? And we need to also have um, more tooling, <laughs> oh, tooling leads to more tooling around some of these things. Like, for example, let's say, you know, we have a specific um, bot that helps you like cite more articles, uh, more diverse sources. Um, so there, there could be like a, an article suggester of like, okay, like, you know, we see that you're citing an article about X, like here's a similar article, like maybe from a different source that could have a different viewpoint, like we suggest that you read this in order to have like a more neutral and multifaceted opinion about like whatever you're writing about. So that could be a, a helpful tooling, then another tooling could be like, okay, like, you know, we're helping you grammar check, which is probably like already something people use. And I think so. AI, it's not just that like the whole thing needs to be working end to end for AI to be useful to humans. I think that we can also consider like more careful development of tools that can help people, um, even if you know you can't auto generate an entire Wikipedia article at the same time. Yeah, it really does seem like so much of the future, at least in the near term, is going to be about human machine interaction and how we how we make that communication almost more and more effective. Different forms of prompt engineering, different forms of evaluation. Um, one way in which I guess that that complexity, I would imagine it could manifest, is like weird um, opt weird optimization quirks. Like you know when you talk about uh, we want to make sure that a sentence is accurate and we we judge accuracy based on the entire sentence being accurate. I wonder if that might like create an incentive, for example, for uh, text generation of very short sentences, so that you end up essentially having this this artifact of the selection process uh, coming into play. Is is that a thing that you've observed, or um... I think not that I've observed, but definitely something I've thought about. So there's this field of theory of mind, essentially like how do humans like understand AI, and like I think one of the things that is interesting is that the mistakes that uh, humans assume AI can make. Um, and the mistakes AI actually makes can be like totally different. So I was right. reading like one paper and many people um, as assume that like AI can do math perfectly, <laughs> but actually it cannot. Like a lot of a lot of models, you know, they can't really like add or multiply super accurately or they don't guarantee that. But for us, we think like, okay, calculators, they're computers, like AI, right. also a computer, like why not? And so I think that having a stronger understanding of like where mistakes will happen, what kinds of mistakes will happen, will help people use AI technology more. Because I think now a lot of th times when we make assumptions about things, it can lead to harms just because we're not understanding fully our technology. So I often think about cars. So cars are actually like kind of somewhat objectively like a very dangerous piece of technology, right? Like um, a 16 year old, like my sister can just get into a vehicle and like drive it down the street. Um, but I think people understand a lot more about the dangers behind cars. There's a lot of legislation, legislation, a lot of like approval that you need to do. Like my mother needs to sit in the car with her. She can't just drive off by herself. And so like, even though they are very important, I think society has reached like some sort of um, overall understanding about like what it means to be a safe driver and like legislation around it. And I think that a lot of that is lacking in AI. Like we don't really understand the dangers of a lot of technology. 
there's been a lot of rapid innovation. And so some problems that may have existed a few years ago maybe don't exist, but maybe they still exist in certain areas or certain corner cases. And I think that understanding is just not strong and people really haven't reached like a, a consensus around it, which means that it's easy to make wrong assumptions about AI that could be harmful. Actually, that then that, that really resonates. I, I recently did, recorded a podcast with, uh, I think it was a professor at uh, NYU, Sam, Sam Bowman. And um, yeah, yeah, and he was talking, then you might have seen his, his paper actually that he wrote about uh, combating hype in AI and sort of being careful about the, the claims that we make about failure modes of AI systems. Because he was talking to your point about, you know, this idea of taking a system from 2016 or 2017 and saying, hey, look, you know, we know AI has this failure mode, but in reality, you know, the, the goalposts have shifted long since then, and then people kind of still applying that, that mentality. Um, I guess one of the challenges is like for, for legislators, for human systems to keep up with these changes. I mean, it, it's breakneck pace and trying to, trying to you know, keep our, our intuitions up to where the, the technology is seems really hard. Are, are you optimistic about like ways that that could happen or is this just something we're, we're going to have to deal with uh, one way or another? Yeah, I think it's interesting they bring up Sam because so even for researchers, like understanding the capabilities of AI is difficult. I mean, Sam, you know, he made the glue benchmark and then made the super glue benchmark. And at the time when he made super glue, like they were very sure that it was extremely hard, right? Like they ran BERT and it was like, oh, BERT does terribly, you right. know, it just ran the performance. And then the essentially, you know, scaling of the same techniques, like eventually solved super glue as well. And so it's an interesting point of reflection, like the researchers creating the models, you know, don't understand like what is difficult for an AI yeah. and like what could be solved. And I think that it is very interesting to reflect upon this because the benchmarks that we create, they measure very specific types of behavior. Mm -hmm. And so like we need to understand more about like what uh, types of behaviors AI can easily conquer and what types of behaviors like AI just cannot generalize to. And I think there's been a lot of study in this, but we haven't really like fully understood this. And I think that you know, we're still at a point where AI is making a lot of rapid progress, but even researchers were still confused. So like, how can we expect like every, everyone on the street who might be using this technology to be, you know, understanding. And I think that's where, you know, it's really important as a researcher to reflect, like when you create a type of tooling, it's like, what are the limitations? Like what's wrong with it? Um, so for, for me, like one of the things in, in my work is that all of it focuses on English. And when you talk about like women in Asia or women in Africa, you know, many of those places, they don't speak English as a native language. So like, why would there necessarily be a lot of English Wikipedia articles? Maybe we should develop tooling for people in their native language. And so I think it's really important um, to reflect on that. And I hope that uh, people kind of think about the corner cases and how AI might be used and what that means. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I guess it's the classic human problem of, of trying to come up with a single number that captures everything. You know, this is like, we, we haven't done it in 10,000 years. And there's something about AI that sort of forces us to solve that problem really fast because we find ourselves formalizing essentially uh, metrics that need optimization and processes to optimize. Like there's there's almost like no escape. You can't hide behind fuzzy words or, or philosophical ideas that aren't grounded. Um, is that like, I don't know, is that a, a cause of concern for you looking at what you're doing? Yeah, I, I think this is extremely controversial and people will have very different opinions. Definitely for myself, like, you know, before even reflecting on the work, just like myself as a person, one of the things that I was nervous about is that I am not a very competitive individual <laughs> and AI is a rather competitive field. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I was worried about was just like not like not feeling like, you know, motivated to to work on tasks that were really competitive because like, I'm like constantly worried about being scooped or like, you know, the number constantly moving. And that's actually something that I had to face just like as a researcher myself, like disconnected from the actual like research I'm producing. Um, but overall, I think it really depends on the person where you fall on this. I think that sometimes it also has to do with the value between what we think of like as like large scale metrics, right? Like you can compute one number on like a million documents versus like small scale kind of human analysis where you might look at a hundred documents like really in detail. And so I almost think that there's a little bit of a divide between like qualitative analysis, if you will, and like quantitative analysis. And I think that both of them have um, really important places, but it's just important to understand like where those things will shine, right? Like having a high level statistical summary of a, of a data set, it's really important, right? Because people want to know like, 
what's the average length of each document in your data set? Um, how many different words are there? But like, you know, showing an example of what that data set looks like, you know, you could never publish a data set paper without that. So there's clearly value in showing small scale examples and doing this type of like deep dive error analysis. And I think it's more about just like understanding the strengths of different types of analysis and different types of metrics and and taking that together and i think ultimately a lot of things are going to be about compromise there's probably never going to be a case where like every single metric points positive and so i think a lot of it is just about understanding the drawbacks and making that more transparent for users so when i think about things like translation you know exposing to users that like you know this translation we are not sure if it is accurate right. versus like these translations have been verified by other people and i think that's extremely extremely important so that people understand you know what confidence they can have and I think that this is rising because in society in general, people assume that technology works, right? Like if I text my yeah. husband, 100%, I expect that text to reach him. And so like if people apply that same confidence to AI now, you know, it's just not performing at that standard yet. And so I think it's really important for that level of transparency to be there. Yeah, and, and uh, a leveling of the playing field as well, because it's, it's one thing for someone who actually like builds AI systems for a living to have that level of confidence or to know how to put in context a warning that says, hey, by the way, we're, you know, we're not super sure maybe the, but if you're just some, you know, some grandpa or so, some, some, you know, somebody who's from a generation not familiar or from an area part of the world not familiar with technology, all of a sudden, you kind of have to like make sure that it's robust across all those different uh, demographics. And I mean, I guess it's that's the human problem. That's a UI UX problem, ultimately, isn't it? One hundred percent. Yeah, a lot of work in explainable AI, especially for sequence models, they focus a lot on attention, basically like showing where the model was looking in order to make that mm. um, you know answer and producing like these beautiful attention maps. And I think that's something that's very useful for researchers. But if you present that to someone else, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of them are extremely blurry. Like they, people don't, people need like different types of, you know, explainable mechanisms. For example, in question answering, a lot of explainable question answering is like, okay, well, which document do we find the answer from? But then let's say like you're asking a question to your like a uh, voice assistant and you want to know like, okay, how did you get that answer? And the voice assistant spends the next like five minutes reading to you the Wikipedia article that it found the answer from. It's completely not useful. And so I think that oftentimes, you know, there is a level right now where researchers are trying to understand AI and make it explainable, but then like having that explanation be actually useful practically for people to understand AI, understand some of the failings or all some of the successes is like a whole nother level of stuff. And for me, I'm actually quite excited about not just thinking of AI as like a computer science engineering type problem, but thinking of it more broadly. I think there's a lot of room in AI for ethicists, sociologists, but like UI, UX designers, just to think about, you know, what is AI research? It should encompass yeah. like a, a wide variety of fields in order for it to be actually successful and also useful to people. Absolutely. And, and actually, you know, even to your point about explanation, if, to a human, if, if you if you ask me to explain, for example, like what is what does your company do? You know, like there's so many different levels of explanation that you could offer depending on the like I can't, I don't start my explanation without summoning a mental model of of my interlocutor of the person I'm talking to. My the first thing I do is I go, okay, you know, what's this person's background? You know, are they technical? Are they non-technical? Have they built a startup before? Have they not? Like all these things, explaining our hobbies goes the same way. Explaining anything, they're like levels of abstraction that we have to kind of target. And there's almost like a missing input there about who the person is that you're you're dealing with, that uh, seems fairly inescapable. Yes, controllability and like adaptation. So I, I was very, you know how like the field of medicine is always shifting towards like personalized medicine or stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was very interested in this direction of like more personalized AI models, like controllable models. And I studied this in the area of summarization. And my thinking was like, okay, for summarization, some people, they just want like the one liner. What's the takeaway? Right. Some people want like a lot of detail or some people, you know, like they're a super big you know, football fan of a specific player. So like, regardless of whatever the article is about, you got to deliver the information about yeah. that player. Um, or, you know, so I face this, like I'm following the, the news in Ukraine every morning. And so I check CNN live updates as like my first thing in the morning. But, you know, if you've been following very closely, then you just want the, the newest stuff, right? Like you don't want like, you know, yeah. here's a reminder of like everything that's happened. And so uh, adapting 
essentially the information that we present to people or our summarization tooling based on your understanding of who that person is, what they want, I think is extremely interesting um, field as well and would make AI like differentially useful to many different people and thus like, you know, not a one size fits all type mechanism because the way people want to consume content, it's not one size fits all. Yeah, which actually in some ways maybe brings us back to Wikipedia as well. There's a problem I remember having had in grad school where, so so my like grad school experience was in, in physics and um, there was a kind of joke in, in our little grad student lounge that anytime you went to Wikipedia, you would get one of two outcomes. You get an article that was like so basic that it was totally useless to you. Or you'd get an article that was so complex with so many equations that you'd be like, I need to read a book before I can read the article. And, and it seems as though not only in the axis of sort of like covering more bases, co having broader coverage of, of more uh, of more people, you know, people with different backgrounds, also at the level of just making articles, like tuning articles to the right level of complexity. Obviously, that would require a whole lot of UX change at Wikipedia's end. I'm not pretending that that's a thing that, that would happen tomorrow. But that seems like another interesting direction for work like this to evolve into. Yeah, I, I think the direction of like presenting information in a way that your specific audience will understand is extremely important. I'm like, you make this podcast, right? Like, you know, like who, who is listening to this podcast. So we talk about things that are specialized to that audience. And I think that in general, you know, the, the way human information has been collected, it, you know, people who write the Wikipedia articles are often super specialized or not super specialized. Right. And I think that's an area where we really need to target. And a lot of times information on Wikipedia or any encyclopedia, it, it may not feel digestible because you may feel like this article has been written for someone totally different. And so I think that there's a lot to be done there about how we present information, how we organize information, and then how we naturally give people the opportunity to dig deeper. And so like, you know, UX that allows people to be like, okay, I understand this, like, let me dig deeper into this other thing, or let me like check out these other references or things like that, that could be really useful. And I think that's actually why like popular science novels are like so um, well read, like always on the New York Times bestseller list, because people want to learn information, but they just want to learn it in a way that's accessible, that's understandable, you know, having a lot of analogies, stories, something that they can consume, and not like a dry publication <laughs> that we may have published at like PNAS or something. <laughs> Doesn't doesn't quite hit the spot. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, so one last question I did want to ask on this on the um, the specific project that you've just completed. This is more forward looking, but as you um, as you imagine a world where more and more text, Wikipedia text, is generated in an automated way, or at least in a way that's let's say assisted by automation, uh, is there a risk that we start having the snake eating its own tail? Is there a risk that we have you know GPT four is going to be trained on the text that was you know produced by GPT three and and so on? So like, what artifacts do you expect that to create? Is this a problem? Do you, can you think of any solutions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's extremely problem. Like if you put two automated chatbots to talk to each other, very quickly it will devolve because like chatbot one will make a mistake, chatbot two hasn't seen that mistake in its training corpus, yeah. so it gets confused, it produces another mistake, and it just gets worse and worse. And I think often like, so I studied gender bias and dialogue before um, as one of the things that also got me interested in, in gender bias. And one of the things is that like, if you have a gender bias in your data set, oftentimes models amplify that bias. And so like, let's say the gender split is like 60, 40 in your data set. Well, when the model generates, it's more like 70, 30, and it gets like worse and worse. So I think it is extremely, extremely important for us to understand like where we curate data from. And I think that a lot of times now, well, there's a rising focus now in like, you know, First of all, documenting the model, right? Like model cards, data sheets, right. but also like documenting where the data came from, how it was sourced, like who produced that data. And I think that when we talk about transparency and AI, you know, we need to take it to a new level. Now, I think before people really focused on things just like open sourcing the model, open sourcing the code, but now like open sourcing a lot of decisions that you made. So let's talk about uh, data. You know, to train GPT, you know, you had to create your data in some way, but you also filtered your data in some way. Right. And each of those decisions is extremely important. And it's actually one of those things that's really poorly documented. It's not like papers devote like three pages to like exactly how they filtered, but probably a lot of things went in there and they were very heuristic. And because models are so expensive to train, it's not like it's easy for us to change like one of those things and then yeah. retrain and observe the effect. And so I think that we really need to start documenting these things very carefully and also analyzing the effect of these things. But one of the biggest problems is that, you know, when you study things at a small scale, let's say a 100 million parameter model trained on like 
10 gigabytes of text. It's not the same conclusion that you might get if you yeah. study things at GPT-3 scale. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges facing our research community because we're not able to study things in like a reasonable amount of compute. And many things are blocked by just having access to compute, having access to models, having access to them that amount of data. And so this is like an area where I've been spending a lot of my time thinking about because I think it's really important. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm especially curious actually about that um, idea you introduced of the gender imbalance amplification. Do you have a sense of like what is the what's the technical cause of that? Like why yeah, what why do we why do we see that happen? Yeah, so if you think about pronouns, for example, like you know, language models, they learn a distribution uh, over the data, right? So when they predict language models, they predict a probability distribution over the next word. And so if you just see he a lot more frequently than you see she, uh, statistically, you know, you, you're probably going to be more likely to produce that. And so this is work that we did with uh, Emily Dinan and Adina Williams like a couple years ago. And we have our paper on analyzing gender bias in some dialogue corpora. And we have like a lot of examples where, you know, the model just sees King a lot more. And so it just produces that a lot more um, because, you know, models, they don't predict a diversity of words <laughs> necessarily. But, but would you expect, I guess naively, I would have expected the models prior to map onto the prior in the data. So if it's 60, 40, um, he, she in the, in the data set, I might have expected the model to generate like 60, 40 rather than 70, 30. Is there like an explanation for, for that, uh, that amplification piece? Yeah, so I think if you think about like beam search, for example, like the way models generate, they often get stuck in the same kind of high probability space. And so like for a while, this was in dialogue, it's like the I don't know problem. Like why do models always generate I don't know? Right. It's because they often generate the most like generic um, short sentences. So you're not gonna get like a very diverse sentence out of a model generation. And so we worked on this like, you know, the the top K sampling um, technique that's like widely used is like one of, right. from one of my original story generation papers. And it was just to introduce like a little bit more diversity in the generation by trying to generate not in the, not only at the, the top of the space yeah. probability distribution, but further down later, like the top P sampling had the similar motivation and it's just about encouraging more diversity. Um, but I think this is like, yeah, generic output and text generation is part of the problem. Interesting. Okay. So you might expect things like, um, actually being careful about how you do regularization or increasing the temperature of, of the, of the model to kind of help with this naively Would that. Make sense? Yeah, people have, to, yeah, ha definitely have experimented with these types of things. There's also been like a lot of work on diverse beam search, like penalizing things that are very common in the beam. I think overall, it's an area where many things have been tried, but probably many people are still generating with like top P or top K because it's like the most straightforward way to yeah. kind of like. So, <laughs> yeah, that's like the story of humanity, I guess. Um, actually, one last question I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on, and it's more speculative, but the, what, are, what are the main obstacles that you see standing in the way of taking a, uh, a model and generating something like, let's make it really bold, a book length piece of text while remaining coherent based on what you've seen? Like, can we strip away all the inductive priors and just be like, generate this giant corpus? What's missing there? I think some sense of plan or structure. Uh, you know, when you write a book, you have a motivation for it, you plan out the chapters, you know how, like, you know, there's a hierarchical method for that. And I think the promise of hierarchical text generation, we have not like yet reached it and still we're still stuck on like, you know, generating from word one to word n. And I, I think having that higher level plan to guide the writing will help the model stay on, stay on topic and just create like multiple paragraphs to build on each other into the same endpoint. And the other thing is just really like, uh, coherency, lack of repetition, and fluency, because even GPT, if you let it babble for a long time, it's it still becomes like out of the training distribution. And so we're not training necessarily on like, you know, data sets of books. And so I think it's really important for us to kind of tackle this like length generalization problem and how we can track what we've, what we've generated. And the last thing is having access to more information. So I think a lot of models now, they have what we, what I think of as like more implicit knowledge. So they've trained on a large set, set of data. And so they have knowledge kind of implicitly stored in their parameter space. Um, but I think that there's a lot of kind of updates necessary, right? Like when the next election comes, we might have a new president. Right, right. Um, and so like, how do you update that information? And so having access to different types of knowledge to use at different times, like the um, converting 
you know, implicit representation knowledge to like also having access to explicit knowledge or like updates to that information would allow for just the creation of, I think, more interesting uh, stories or book like things. That makes it makes a lot of sense. And actually, to, so to the I don't think this would deal with the, the second point, but to the first one, we're talking about the um, uh, the idea of hierarchical learning and planning. Do you think this is something that gets solved by like just larger context windows and more scaling? Or is this something that we're going to need to tackle with like bespoke architectures? I think we're going to need better architectures. Like there's been a lot of work on lar longer context um, transformers. And I think overall, um, nothing has like really allowed us to, to generate a book yet. And I think a lot of the, the ways we're tackling it now, maybe we just like can't measure on the benchmarks that we have. So if you take a uh, long context right. language modeling for a while, we were stuck on like character level perplexity on like wiki text. That's great. But you know, like you're competing for like 0 0.01, 0 0.001 kind of points there. And in order to generate Wikipedia, it's at the character level, I don't think you need to look like 100,000 characters um, in the past. And so I think that there have been the development of different benchmarks like long range arena, just where we can study these problems and where they manifest like actually when we can see change in metrics. Um, so I think like just being able to measure the problem we're really trying to solve will help us. And the other thing is that we might need a step change in technology. You know, LSTMs they lasted us a while, and transformers I'm sure they'll last us a while. But do I think that like you know, a hundred years from now we'll still be using a transformer? Maybe not. You know. That's yeah. It doesn't seem likely based on the the pace at which things are moving. But who knows? Transformers are also very impressive and. Uh... Thank you so much for this amazing overview, overview, Angela. I mean, like exciting space, exciting problem that you're working on, and and what an interesting background as well. Is there um, is there anywhere you recommend people go to learn more about what you're working on right now? I, I know there'll be a. By the way, as we record this, I don't think that the formal announcement officially has come out uh, about your Wikipedia work, but it should be by the time folks are listening to this. So um, that'll be one thing. But are there other like blog posts or things like that that you can recommend? Yeah, I mean, definitely check out. Uh, Wikipedia Women in Red project and other related projects. Uh, and remember, everyone can edit Wikipedia. So if this is something that you want to make an impact on, even if you're not a researcher yourself, you know, you can always go on Wikipedia and contribute as an editor. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Angela. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited.